Welcome to Cedar Lane United Methodist Church and to the International Sunday School lesson for Sunday, September 8th, 2024. I'm Rick Abbott, and our lesson for today is from 1 Kings chapter 8. It's about the dedication of the first temple in Jerusalem, which was completed by King Solomon around 957 BC. In today's scripture passage, the Bible tells us about a prayer that Solomon offered to God at the temple's dedication. Our lesson materials say that the prayer that Solomon offered in today's lesson is the second longest prayer in the entire Bible. Only the prayer in Nehemiah chapter nine is longer. That prayer in Nehemiah was offered by Levitical priests as the law was read publicly and as the people confessed their sins. It took place around 445 BC, many years after the second temple was completed in 516 BC. I mentioned Nehemiah and the second temple because in today's lesson, I'm going to briefly look at the whole history of the temple throughout the Bible, but it's not 50 minutes, don't worry. Um, as Danny said last week, it helps to read the scripture passages in context. Oh, hi. I didn't even notice. As Danny said last week, it helps to read the scripture passages in context. We need to know what the scriptures mean in the context of the culture and historical setting in which they were written. But we also need to understand scriptural passages in the context of everything else the Bible is saying. And that is part of what I want to accomplish today. But first, let's look at today's scripture passage in 1 Kings. In a key part of Solomon's prayer in the dedication of the first temple, which is included in today's scripture. Paul, Solomon made the following request to God. He said, when a prayer or plea is made by anyone among your people Israel, being aware of the afflictions of their own hearts and spreading their hands toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive and act. And deal with everyone according to all they do, since you know their hearts, for you alone know every human heart. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. The temple was a place where God and the people of Israel came together. It was a place where heaven and earth overlapped. And it was a house of prayer. You might remember that when Jesus cleansed the second, <clears throat> when Jesus cleansed the temple in Luke chapter 19, he said to the money changers, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Jesus was quoting from Isaiah chapter 56, verse seven, where the Bible adds that God's house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And he's also quoting from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, where God asks Israel, has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? The temple provided a place where God and his people could relate to each other. It was a house of prayer. The importance of prayer in the temple is re-emphasized in 2 Chronicles. And I'll give you a little background of that. The Bible repeats today's story from 1 Kings chapter 8 in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. The books of 1 and 2 Chronicles repeat the stories of 1 and 2 Samuel through 1 and 2 Kings. In the Hebrew Bible, Chronicles came at the end, and it was a summary of Israel's whole history in the Old Testament. Consequently, 2 Chronicles chapter 6 is part of a retelling of the temple dedication story. And following the Chronicles account, God appears to Solomon after the dedication of the temple, and he says to him, 
I've heard your prayer and, and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's a very famous verse we remember, but it was said to God, said from God to, to Solomon after the dedication of the temple. And shortly after that, God promises Solomon that God's name, his eyes, and his heart will be with his people forever. God says, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I've chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 15 and 16. We all remember God's promise of forgiveness and healing for the nation, which I just quoted in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. But we forget God's promise to remain with his people so that his name, eyes, and heart would remain with them for all time. Notice, however, that God did not promise that that temple would last forever, and the temple that Solomon dedicated was eventually torn down. The Babylonians destroyed that temple in 587 B.C., or maybe 586 B.C., I get both the dates. And shortly after that, the Babylonians took the people of Israel into captivity. The temple was rebuilt on the same, same site 70 years later in 516 BC when Cyrus, king of Persia, defeated Babylon and allowed the Hebrew captives to return to the promised land. That was in fulfillment of prophecy because the prophet Jeremiah had predicted that Israel would remain in captivity for 70 years. See Jeremiah 25 verses 9 through 13. So from the destruction of the temple to the rebuilding was exactly 70 years. Centuries later, King Herod the Great expanded this second temple in the years just prior to Jesus' birth. Construction probably started around 20 B.C. and continued for 46 years. The Bible tells us the amount of time that Herod and his successors spent expanding the temple in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 20. Consequently, and it, they said it was 46 years, so consequently, Herod's expanded temple was probably completed just a few years before the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. I'll come back to this verse from John's gospel in a few minutes. But like the first temple, Herod's temple was eventually torn down. Jesus predicted the destruction of Herod's temple in Matthew chapter 24, when he said, Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Matthew chapter 24, verse 2. This prophecy was fulfilled about the time of Passover in April of AD 70 by the Roman general Titus, who later became emperor of Rome. I looked at a video this week preparing, that, preparing this lesson, and apparently some of the stones that were thrown down, as Jesus had predicted, are still lying at the bottom of the western por portion of the Temple Mount today. And I guess Danny could tell us something about that since Danny and Mary lived in Israel for a while. They were big stones and they're just still laying there. Now, I want to change the direction a little bit. For the rest of this lesson, I want to talk about the topic of the temple as it's discussed throughout the Bible. It goes from the first few pages of Genesis 
through the last few pages of Revelation. Reviewing the role of the temple helps us set up the theme for this fall quarter. The theme for this quarter's materials is worship in the covenant community. And in the Old Testament, worship generally took place at the temple. Before the temple existed, Abraham built altars for worship. Danny talked about that last week. Later, as we read the latter part of Exodus, Moses built a tabernacle at the foot of Mount Sinai. Then many years after Moses, David moved the Ark of the Covenant to a tabernacle in Jerusalem, a Jebusite city conquered by David that never belonged to any of the tribes before David made it Israel's capital city. David wanted Jerusalem to be the political and split <clears throat> the political and spiritual center of the nation. And he wanted to build a temple there. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Lord tells David through the prophet Nathan that David's heir would build the temple instead of David. But he also promised the, the king that his royal line would last forever, a promise that was fulfilled by Jesus. After David died, Solomon became king and built the first temple. As I mentioned earlier, that temple was later destroyed by the Babylonians. But even with the temple in, Jer in Jerusalem in ruins, God came to his people in Babylon. This was a major turning point in Israel's understanding of God. God was the God of all creation and as, as, as Ezekiel experienced by the Kibar River, God could meet his people anywhere. He wasn't limited to the temple. As the God of all creation, God could use foreign kings to accomplish his purposes. Through the Persian king Cyrus, Israel was allowed to come home to the promised land, just as Isaiah had predicted in Isaiah chapter 45, when Israel returned to the promised land, they rebuilt the temple on its original site. And we can read about that in Ezra and Nehemiah. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let me go back to the beginning and take you through this story one more time. And let's go back to the very beginning. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Where the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's a lot of things happening in that one verse. Genesis 1.1 sets out two realms, heaven and earth. And it also sets out a progression. The heavens came first and then came the earth. Heaven is a place where God rules. And the earth is the place where God intended to rule through his image. In other words, human beings. Earth is a place where God always intended to delegate his authority through humanity. See Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. When we pray the Lord's Prayer every Sunday, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying for the fulfillment of that divine purpose. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. And that's how he told us to pray. We're supposed to play a role in reuniting heaven and earth. The church is supposed to become a kind of new Eden where people can get a glimpse of what heaven is like. And I'll come back to that idea in just a moment. For now, let's move on to verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1. Don't get scared. I will get through this on time. But Genesis 2 verse, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. That verse tells us the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was on the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The word for deep 
in this verse means abyss. And the Spirit of God was hovering over those waters. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, through Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, is about how God brought order out of chaos so that humanity and God could rest together in perfect unity. That's what the Sabbath rest was about. On day 7, God rested on his throne. That's where he rested. He didn't go to bed. He sat on his throne and began to reign through us as he always intended. At the end of day six, God said creation was very good. But very good is not the same thing as perfect. Perfection requires completion. The work has, has to be done. But the, but the work was not finished. God had always planned for us to dwell with him in a holy city. And we read that in Revelation, the New Jerusalem. And it was supposed to be count, populated by countless people. And that city did not yet exist in Genesis chapter 1 and, verse, and chapter 2. And lots of people. Lot, billions of people still had to be born. The work was not done. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 that God had finished the work he had been doing. But as Jesus told us, work was still going on. In John chapter 5, when Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath, he told the Jewish leaders, my father is at his work to this very day, and I too am working. John chapter 5, verse 17. God rested from some of the things he had been doing in order to create order out of chaos. And he delegated some of the rest of the job to humanity. But he didn't stop everything he was doing. And I could say more about that, but I'm not going to do that now. I want to return to the discussion of the temple. In order to do that, I want to say a few words about the Garden of Eden. I think this is very important. Gar the Garden of Eden functioned like a temple. And that's a, a key to understanding everything about the Garden of Eden and about the Bible, really. The focus of chapter 1 of Genesis is on the creation and ordering of the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1 1 through Genesis 2 verse 3. That's, but the focus of chapters 2 and 3 of Genesis, it's not just retelling the story of creation, it's talking about the Garden of Eden. Eden was a special place within creation where heaven and earth overlapped, it was a high and holy place. We know it was a high place because four rivers originated in Eden. Ancient people knew, it was obvious, that rivers started out in high places and then flowed downhill as gravity pulled the water toward the sea. Ancient people also believed that heaven was up high, heaven was in the sky, and earth was down below. <clears throat> and on mountaintops, heaven and earth overlapped. And that's why they worshipped often on the top of mountains. And it's also where they made artificial mountains or high places like pyramids and ziggurats. For example, God spoke to his people on Mount Sinai. The temple was built on Mount Moriah, which was late, also called Mount Zion. And Jesus' transfiguration probably took place on Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon, both of which are relatively near Jesus' home base in Galilee. See Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. Eden was a high place, but it was also a holy place. The word for Eden means delight. And it was considered a, to be a paradise where God and humanity dwelt together. Remember when Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. 
Luke chapter 23, verse 43. He was talking about something that was a delight, like Eden was. Jesus, the word translated in Greek, that Jesus said to the thief on the cross when he said the word paradise came from an ancient Persian word which meant an idyllic garden park. Paradise was recalling imagery of Eden. The Old Testament prophet Ezekiel appears to call Eden the holy mountain of God. See Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 and 14. In the middle of the garden was a place that was especially holy, sort of like the holies of ho the holy of holies within the temple. In this very holy place grew the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eden had a tripartite structure like the tabernacle and the temple. The tabernacle and the temple had their outer courts the holy place, and the holy of holies. Eden was surrounded by the outer world. Eden itself was a holy place. And the garden in the middle of Eden was a very holy place, like the holy of holies. God's presence filled the garden, just as his presence filled the temple in Isaiah chapter 6. In Genesis 3, the Bible says that God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And throughout the Garden of Eden story, God interacts with Adam and Eve in a very personal way. Adam had a job in Eden. He was to tend the garden. And Eve was Adam's partner and helper in that undertaking. They were both acting in the image of God, as we learn in Genesis chapter 1. And Adam and Eve worked together as royal priests in paradise, bringing order to the garden by tending it, just as God brought order to creation by speaking out his word. We also know that spiritual beings existed in the garden. For example, in Revelation, the serpent mentioned in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 seems to be identified as Satan. See Revelation 12, 9 and Revelation 20, verse 2. In Ezekiel chapter 28, the Bible talks about a guardian cherub in Eden that revolts against God's leadership and eventually is expelled from the garden. Again, this seems to be a reference to Satan. In the temple and the tabernacle, images of winged cherubs guarded the Holy of Holies. There was a big bowl in the front of the temple called the bronze sea and in front of the and, and it, it recalled rivers flowing out of eden and figures around the sea showed cattle and lions side by side sort of like the image of the wolf and the lamb feeding together in isaiah chapter 65 palm trees decorated the doors of the temple and lots of garden motifs could be seen in several places within the temple in other words a lot of imagery in the temple evoked imagery of Eden. Now I need to begin to bring this lesson to a close by quickly reviewing a few highlights of the events that occurred, occurred throughout the rest of the Bible. In the garden, humanity rebelled against God and decided to rule creation on their own for their own benefit, based on their own definitions of good and evil rather than ruling creation on God's behalf as servants under God's divine authority. As a result, humanity was removed from the garden and things began to turn bad. The Bible takes us through Noah and the flood, and then as we, we quickly come to the Tower of Babel story in Genesis chapter 11. At the Tower of Babel, humanity tries to ascend to God by building its own artificial high and holy place. And everything goes horribly wrong. The people become divided and scattered, unable to worship God the way God intended. God responds by calling Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. 
Through Abraham, God begins to create special people for the coming of the Messiah. Jesus Christ, as the second Adam and the Son of Man, becomes a new type of human being. God in human form, who through the sacrifice of himself on the cross, has the power to atone for sin and create a completely new heavens and new earth where God and all of creation can exist together in loving unity. Let me add something here. I've been... My next lesson I'm supposed to teach is on the Passover, and I've been going through the timeline and things like that. And Easter occurred, that first Easter occurred, best I can understand, on the Feast of New Fruits, which was 50 days before the Feast of Weeks, which was Pentecost. And the, the Feast of New Fruits uh, happens on at the day after the first Sabbath after Passover. So it would always occur on a Sunday. And Paul talks about Jesus as new fruits, as, as the first fruits. I said new fruits, I meant first fruits. Jesus coming, rising from the dead is the beginning of a whole new order of things. Everything's going to change. And the proof in the pudding is him rising from the dead. It's a beginning of a whole new age. First fruits. Anyway, God, let me get back to Abraham. Abraham, God responds to the Tower of Babel by calling Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Through Abraham, God begins to, uh, well, I'll skip back. Okay. I need to skip on ahead now. There's not time to talk about the altar that Abraham built to God on Mount Moriah after God prevented him from sacrificing his son Isaac, or about the tabernacle that Moses built at the foot of Mount Sinai after God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. Neither can I spend time about discussing the altar of David that he built on Mount Moriah in 2 Samuel chapter 24 after he bought a threshing floor from Aronah, the Jebusite, after a plague broke out. The land where David built that altar was the same place Abraham had offered up Isaac. That spot on Mount Moriah eventually became to be called Mount Zion. And it became the place where Solomon built the first temple. That's where the temple started. There's a lots of other things that could be said about the temple, but I need to skip all that for now. I need to skip on into the New Testament. I said earlier that I had something else to tell you about when Jesus said uh, what Jesus said about the temple in John chapter 2, you know, where they said it had been 46 years building the temple. Jesus had, at that point in John chapter 2, Jesus had just driven out the money changers from the temple. And the Bible says the religious leaders wanted to know by what authority Jesus had driven them out. And Jesus answered them by saying this. He said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. The Jewish leaders responded by saying it took 46 years to build Herod's temple and you're going to raise it up in three days? At this point in the gospel account, John tells us that the temple Jesus was talking about was his own body. John chapter 2, verses 21. And this harkens back to the idea about first fruits. The temple was supposed to be a place where heaven and earth came together and where God and humanity could dwell together in loving unity. As both God and man, Jesus was, a, was both divine and human. And his body became the place where the temple functioned was fulfilled. 
God and man dwelling in perfect unity together in one person. After the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came in to indwell the church. And you remember they spoke in tongues. That's a reversing of the confusion of tongues that occurred in the Tower of Babel story that I mentioned earlier. And what happened there is instead of people being scattered, diverse people from all over the world were brought back together in one divine family. Through Christ's death and resurrection, God has now come to dwell in humanity through the power of the Holy Spirit. The church, as an assembly of God's children, is now God's temple. We are now Christ's body. And as Christ's body, we're the temple. Because God, God, God through Jesus, was saying that his body was the temple. And we're his body. And now it is within our hearts and minds that heaven and earth come together. Heaven and earth overlap in us. And through our eyes, an image of God is reflected as God lives in us. And so the image of God shines out for the earth, for the world to see. That's part of what Jesus meant when he said, you're the light of the world. We're reflecting God's image, shining like a city on a hill. We now radiate with God's life and love. But we've still not reached the perfect conclusion God has in store for us. As the people of God, we look forward to new heavens and new earth which Jesus was the first fruits for. And in that new earth and new heavens, there is no need for a separate temple anymore. Read Revelation chapter 21, verses 22 through 23. God's presence will fill all creation and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 14, verse 14. It's only then when the current heavens and earth have passed away that the story of the temple will come to an end. There'll be a perfect Sabbath rest. We will rest in God and God will rest in us. And as Jesus said in John chapter 17, we will experience the perfect loving unity that the persons of the Godhead enjoyed with each other before the world began. And so, as the Bible ends in Revelation chapter 22, when that perfect loving unity comes to be, we can echo the words of Scripture by praying, Come, Lord Jesus. That day when there is no more temple is what we look for. And until that day arrives, we can also pray as the last scripture in the Bible. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all of God's people. Amen.